Hi, everyone. I'm Anu, a partner at YC Continuity, and we have Enrique here, who is the founder of Brex, which was a YC Winter 17 company. Uh, Brex also, you know, uh, the exciting news about Brex is they're actually launching um, soon and uh, they offer corporate credit cards. They're basically redefining how corporate credit cards work for startups. So we're very excited to have Enrique here. Um, Enrique, let's start a little bit about your background. We obviously at YC have known you for a very long time, uh, both you and Pedro. Um, and you guys started you know, your first fintech startup when you were at the ages of 15 and 16, which is not, you know, something we see every day. So can you tell us a little bit about what was the first company you founded? And then how did you find your path to Y Combinator? Yeah, for sure. Um, so first, thanks for having me here. Yeah. Um, and so Pedro and I, we both, um, we both started coding pretty early. I think that was super helpful. Uh, I think that was a little bit lucky. Uh, How early was that? So I was started when I was 12 because there was this game I wanted mm-hmm. to play. It was like a paid game and my parents didn't want to pay it for me. And I figured out if I learned how to code, I could play it for free. Mm-hmm. Um, and Pedro, like nobody knows how, how he started coding, but he started coding when he was like nine years old. Mm-hmm. Um, and then during our teenage years, we, we did a lot of like uh, interesting things. So um, I participated in building this emulator for this game and I learned a lot how to code it because of that. And like, I built like a version of that game. Pedro, on the other hand, when he was uh, 12, he found like the first jailbreak for the iPhone 3G, which got like a lot of um, attention. And uh, so we, we had during our teenage years, a bunch of like experiences already in tech uh, that led us to believe it's possible to start a company. Um, so for me, it was that I was working at this startup and did the founder, I thought it was like a really cool guy. And my thought was like, well, if he can do it, I can do it too. And then I tried to start an education company and that didn't work out. And then I met Pedro in the end of 2012, basically fighting on Twitter, mm-hmm. um, programming text editors, Vim versus Emacs. Mm-hmm. And I was Vim, he was Emacs. Uh, and I won. Um, <laughs> and uh, we basically became super friends and decided to start a company together, which was Pagarme. Mm-hmm. Pagarme was like a payment processor, online payment processor down in Brazil. Um, I think the comparables here would be like something like Stripe or Braintree or WePay or like those kind of companies. Um, and we we grew that company from to a pretty reasonable size, so mm-hmm. uh, it was like a, a really good experience. And, and you raised only three hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, it wasn't by option that much at that point. Uh-huh. Um, so we were fifteen and sixteen when we started a company. So it's not like a lot of people in Brazil were willing to give us much more than that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then after we raised the money, we were like, "Oh, this is so much money! Like we can do whatever we want with this." And um, we were lucky that payments in Brazil, uh, it's in terms of margin, a better business than most of the world. Mm -hmm. Um, So we were able to have a profitable company since I think the end of the first year. Okay, that's great. And that was super helpful because then we just grew with our own profits. We didn't have the need to to fundraise and uh, profits solve a lot of problems if you can have them. That's (laughs) true. And you sold the company four years later when your team size was around 100. Yeah. So we we grew the company. uh, I feel the stats were at the time we sold it. We're doing a little bit over 1.5 billion in um, transaction volume. Mm -hmm. Um, We had, I think, a a little bit over 100 people, I think 110, 115, Mm -hmm. something like that. Um, And uh, we sold it September 16. So that was probably like three years and a half, almost four years. Not a lot of people have built a hundred people team and they're less than 20. Why did you sell it? A couple of reasons. Um, I think that we always thought that Pagarme could be a a big business, but it couldn't be something I think as big as our ambition um, because I don't think we had a lot of edge internationally. Mm -hmm. So Brazil is a pretty big market for payments. You can see like Pag Seguro just IPO'd for $9 billion, Mm -hmm. right? Um, but I didn't think we had enough edge to go international. We wanted to build a global company and we got, got it into Stanford also. Mm -hmm. So we were kind of curious to see how that went. Stanford always gets you. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And like from international, it was my dream since I was 14 to go to Stanford, right? So Mm -hmm. it's kind of like that. 
And also one of the things is that I think US is starting to get better at this, but we were craving liquidity a little bit also. Um, and it, it was the combination of all those things. We wanted to build something really big in the US and Silicon Valley that we all always saw these podcasts in Brazil, you know, and we we're like, oh, I want to go there. Like that seems like the cool place to be. And we wanted to try out Stanford because it seemed like so cool. Um, and we wanted the liquidity also. Uh, so I think the combination of those three things uh, made us decide. It was a good offer also. So the combination of those three things decide us to sell, move, and go to Stanford mm -hmm. uh, for a little bit. And I remember, uh, you know, right from your application days, one year into Stanford, you guys uh, had applied to YC uh, with actually an augmented reality startup. Yeah. And by the time you graduated from YC, that's how the, you know, you launched Brex. Um, or you were working on the Brex idea, hadn't launched yet. Can you talk a little bit about, like, how that transition happened? Um, you know, you coming from AR as an idea and then saying, no, you know, we are going to work on uh, the corporate, redefining the corporate credit card experience. Yeah, for sure. Um, so after we got to Stanford, we were like, we're not going to do payments anymore. Fintech, too complicated, dealing with these like old banks, you know, like that's, we're not going to do that anymore. Like we've been through that. Yeah. We're going to do something new, something easier. And then we thought AR was easier. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> Um, and then we started thinking about these ideas, etc. And then it was actually three months into Stanford that we decided that we wanted to apply to YC. Um, and we applied and we got into to, to YC of this AR idea. And then a few weeks in, we were like, okay, this is complicated. Like we don't know anything about hardware. We don't know anything about optics. Like we can we could only build the software, but like if Apple killed an API or Google killed an API, like then the business would be ruined, you know, like there's all these things that we started to think about. And then we're like, okay, um, that's not what we want to do. Um, so then we were like in this limbo and we're super worried is, oh shit, we took YC money. Should we give it back? Like, is that something that we should do? And we talked to partners like, no, 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 go figure out something. And like, okay. And then we started thinking about things we wanted to do. We went through like a bunch of ideas. And then we went back for an idea we thought for a long time. We were like, in Pagarme, we were um, a payment system, right? So we received the money and then we paid out the, um, the, the, the merchants. And we we're like, well, why do I need to pay out the merchants? Why can't I just pay out the suppliers directly, right? Or the employees, why can't I be like... And we started grasping this idea of, oh, what are the B2B financial services that we can generate value, right? And we actually thought about creating a bank. But creating a bank is very complicated as we went to find out in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And then we were like, okay. Especially in the U.S. Especially in the U.S., yeah. yeah. So we went um, and said, okay, let's do a product of a bank. Then all these products are super, super good, right? Um, and then we looked at credit cards. That seemed like a, a one of the products, but we didn't actually go too deep into it. And then... Um, but we, we kind of had this landscape of like B2B financial products. We were kind of looking. And then we wanted to get a corporate credit card like ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and that was kind of it. And then we were talking to one YC partner, uh, Dalton, who also said, hey, all these startups, they have a lot of trouble getting corporate credit cards. We we're like, okay, let's investigate that. And then figured out that one, we couldn't get one. Mm -hmm. um, Why? Because... Well, because like they wanted us, we went there and they're like, well, you don't have any financial history. I was like, but I have $120,000. Mm -hmm. Like that's a lot of money. From YC. Yeah, from YC. Yeah. Like you can just give me $5,000 in limit. I'll be fine. It was like, no, we won't give you it unless you personally guarantee. But we didn't have FICO score because we had just moved to the US. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't personally guarantee the card. And then we went to talk to like a lot of our matchmates and like um, a few of them were like, Oh yeah, I can get a card. All no, none of the international ones could get a card. And the other ones, a lot of people chose not to get a card because like they didn't want to personally guarantee the card. Mm -hmm. Because as I agree with them, like the whole point of building a corporation is not having like personal liability attached to it, right? So there was all these people who just using debit cards and like just walking around with debit cards with one hundred twenty thousand dollars in the bank, or just using their personal cards and like, all these things. It's that okay? That has to be inefficient. Like there has to be a better way to do mm -hmm. this. Um, and then that's kind of like how Brex came to be like by seeing that problem of our batchmates and ourselves 
not being able to get a corporate credit card or having to personally guarantee it, we had the idea of building something better. Uh, so let's talk about the team, right? One of, uh, you know, you guys launched, uh, you launched recently, but you've been there for 18 months or now. And so how, you know, when you launched Brex during YC um, and right after Demo Day, how big was the team? And can you also talk about your first 10 employees? Like how did you hire them and how did you decide who they would be? Yeah, for sure. I think that, one thing that we really believe, and I know everybody says that, is that the employee, the 10 first employee is going to set a foundation for, for mm-hmm. later. And I think that we really took that to heart when we, filed, we, we got our first 10. So in Parkarame, we didn't have a lot of options in the first 10. So we just got the smartest people we know. There was even this guy who didn't know how to code at all, mm-hmm. but he was like a physics Olympics champion. We're like, well, physics seems pretty hard. Coding, I think, is easier than physics. Mm-hmm. So we might as well just hire him and teach him how to code, right? Um, so we hired like uh, people that we we knew that were the smartest and we just like made it work. Um, on Brex, I think we were a little bit more targeted. We were like, okay, those people were, were really good and they're doing really well now. But like, if I could do it the right way from the beginning, what would I do? And the, our first two hires were actually like um, a CFO and a general uh, general counsel. Oh, wow. That's um, quite, I, I would have never, ex- I mean, you know, I know that now because we know you guys, but like, I know most startups are not hiring a CFO and a GC. So. Yeah, exactly. Because Going with that, the thing about getting a really good partner and being able to rebuild everything from scratch and having like the good flow and all of that, um, having a staff that like we're we're still young, right? We're twenty two under twenty one, so it's yeah. not like we're older, but like not that old. Mm-hmm. So when we go to bank, having people who are um, more experienced than you are, and um, having them be the people that actually help you like do the plan and describe everything is really really valuable and we were very um generous of the offers and the packages for these people because we really believe it could like change the way the business went mm-hmm. so we got and what I'm still saying, let me ask you this yeah it is very hard for a founder this early to be able to hire a really credible gc and a cfo right yeah. no matter even if the offer or the package is attractive because they, they you know they probably they probably have multiple options so how did you get them over the line to believe in your mission and join brex so i feel that i think this is a little bit of the advantage of being a second time founder is that i think people who are experienced they want to work with other people who are experienced, so that helped, I think. Mm-hmm. But you guys came from Brazil. Yeah, they so probably that, like, didn't was know the you. Negative part of it <laughs> yeah. too. Um, so I think that basically, so usually founders they have this right, like they have this first product, mm-hmm. and that may or may not have product market fit, but they have this thing, and then they have this like long term vision, and they that's like very very far away, mm-hmm. and they usually don't have the plan in between that much. I think these like more executive level hires, they want to understand better the plan in between. I think that's just something we had really well defined since early on. Is like, okay, we're starting with like this credit card for startups, which is a, I think it's a great market. But like, and then we have this big long term vision. How do we get from here to there? Mm-hmm. I think making that very clear and like how they could like how they would be the difference between getting there and not getting there. Also, like they could add a lot of value there was something that I think got them across the line. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I remember specifically of our GC, we were talking about how um, in order to be able to scale a lot, we would do a lot of the regulatory things he didn't do in his last company. We, he would do it right this time here mm-hmm. and how that would change like this, this, this part of the plan to actually work versus other companies that failed. Like that got him really excited because, okay, I learned so much from the experience. Now I want the opportunity to make it right, to mm-hmm. do it right, mm-hmm. right? So I think that's how um, I got across the line. But also having a really strong set of investors helps a lot. Being able to get where they need on cash. Like a lot of times people want people to take huge pay cuts. We were never that type. We always was pretty generous on cash, like those kind of things. Got it. And then, so they were, the, they were your third and fourth hire. Talk about the next six so who are they and where did they come from? Um, so we didn't have an easy time recruiting them mm-hmm. after that. 
Most companies don't. Yeah, um, because we were from Brazil, so it's not like we knew a bunch of people. Uh, people say, oh, what about your Stanford networkers? Like, I was there for three months and my network is all freshmen. So at least it's not like uh, I knew a ton of people. Like yeah, you were going to be class of 2020, I remember. Exactly, I was yeah. going to be class of 2020. So um, maybe in 2020, I have a bunch of people I can hire. <laughs> um, but it, it was really tough for us. Um, we basically started skewing towards people that were similar to us in some sense because it's what we could so we got a bunch of international folks <laughs> yeah um so i think our our first engineer was uruguayan and then you know we got a french dude and we imported someone from brazil mm -hmm. i think we just did whatever we needed to do for yeah. the first 10 but we didn't we didn't lower our like we didn't um have a quality bar that was lower because of that mm -hmm. we still had like okay these two are really strong they come came from really good companies um so fine stripe and okay how do we keep that bar up mm -hmm. maybe and we we didn't hire a lot waiting to find the right people and that paid off in my mm -hmm. opinion like, so it, you it were slow it. at building the team versus yeah. trying to get the first 10 quickly yeah and we're just like working a lot mm -hmm. <laughs> ourselves so. yeah and how was your interview process especially when you were trying to hire someone from brazil or Uruguay or uh, in these different locations like how did you actually test for that quality bar so we actually brought them here okay um so it's not we we didn't interview them remotely um so we had like technical interview we had our we were a little bit debatable but like we believe that technical interview should be most similar to what the person will do in the day-to-day -day, mm -hmm. um and should test the the knowledge that they would most have to do most decisions with um so we built like this interview that actually they had to build like a small credit card authorizer which is, like a part of it mm -hmm. and we could it was the same interview for someone junior and someone senior the only difference was how well they did the architecture and like the edge cases based on how junior they are and the senior they are like if they were a senior they knew like everything that would go wrong and they would build it or point it out if they didn't have time and if they were junior they would build a simple version of it um and we could tell based on that but then i think the hard part was the selling right like mm -hmm. how do you sell and get these people across the line and i think that for the first 10 it was really hard and we just like people join who believed um, in the team and believed in the mission. And um, we never made compensation a problem. We were always very generous of the initial packages. Um, so we, we were like, so we have this um, really different offer mechanism mm -hmm. that, and this is until today, everyone that joined the company went through yeah. this. Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it yeah. is different and it's very intriguing. Yeah. yeah. Um, we, we call it a pre offer, not an offer, mm -hmm. which we say, hey, if compensation wasn't an issue, you have all these companies you could join, would this be the company you would join? Mm -hmm. And let's discuss that. Until you tell me that this is the company you would join if Comper Central was solved, like, I'm not going to show you an offer. Mm -hmm. And that made the person get over the mental decision of like, this is the company I want to join. And this is why it's better. And then we always gave a super generous offer. It's not like we then lowball them, you know? Mm -hmm. um, we always gave them a great offer. And they were always like very few times we hadn't negotiated. Usually it was like above their expectations. Uh, and then they joined. But we, we've we never had someone that after they accepted a pre-offer, they didn't come because of compensation. We could always find a middle ground in compensation. Mm -hmm. um, That's very counterintuitive to how a lot of startups in the Valley do, right? Yeah. But it's worked very well for you guys, at least so far. Yeah. How did you guys come up with that idea? Like what motivated you to use that approach? So it's something we did in Brazil, I think, because the market, we had this really, we had this really big thing in Brazil that we didn't want people to come because we were paying more because they're mercenaries. We wanted to come because people like of the mission, they be of the company, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think in Brazil, we made the mistake that we actually then lowball people and pay them less than we should. Um, and that was a mistake we learned from. And then when we got here, we we're like, hey, we still want people to come because they enjoy it, like they like the company and they think this is going to be great. And how do we make sure, but we want to compensate people well so we can keep top talent. There's a lot of arguments around why compensating people well is a good idea. How do we merge those two things? And we're like, okay, let's still be people well, but let's not tell them we're going to pay them well before they decide this is the company that they want to join. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that 
it was based on this thing where we want you to make a decision that this is the company you want to join before the money. And we think that's better for them too. Yeah. Right? Like you shouldn't join a company just because they paying you more. Yeah. You should join a company you believe like even economically, like if the, if the company like startups are very binary, right? Like if the company that you join is the one that becomes really big, all the other things won't matter. Like if it's half or twice as much stock. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so. I know we've talked about this a lot, which is you're really looking to form a high performing team that scales with the company. Yeah. And so that's one of the reasons why you guys use the slightly different approach. I think there are a couple of other YC startups that actually use a similar approach, but the large majority doesn't. Yeah, it, it's definitely um, sometimes humbling because yeah. people sometimes say no to you before even seeing the offer. Yeah. Well, like, I'm glad that that happened. Yeah. Because they should go to the company that they believe more, mm -hmm. right? And then we were evaluating and see what was their problem. Maybe they weren't interested in the domain. Maybe they didn't believe us as much. Like, whatever it is, we try to learn from it. But um, we know that it was about the company, not about a comp, you know, like all those things. If they, imagine if they had come just yeah. to the comp. Yeah. What problem would that be, you know? Yeah. One of the other things I've noticed, uh, especially working with you guys closely, is uh, both you and Pedro do spend a lot of time on recruiting. And, you know, uh, and first time founders I've seen generally, you know, don't do that, especially in the early days, and then wait too long before they actually refocus their attention on recruiting. Can you talk a little bit about why you guys uh, do that? And you guys do it pretty well, which is like you spend a lot of time recruiting. And also talk about how much time you spend recruiting. Yeah, so we spend probably 35 to 40 percent of our time recruiting. Um, and that not, not necessarily that doesn't mean sourcing, by the way. Yeah, we think we really like our, I think our well, we haven't hired a recruiter until now, but we had recruiters outsource working for us, I think, since we were like four people. Mm -hmm. Um, and we were big for like we're we don't mind paying recruiting yeah. fees if it's success based only. We don't like paying fees that like we have to pay before, but like if it's success based, we think it's worth it. Um, and we, we, we think that we, we read this in that Google book. I think that Eric Schmidt wrote that, like, don't let the urgency of the hire, like reduce the bar of the people. Mm -hmm. And we've done that so many times, uh, and back in the day, because like you always say, Hey, well, I'm just going to hire someone later. I don't need that person now. What this person, like they're going to come and they're going to do what? Like there's all these arguments. And the end of the day, we just believe that to find the best people, you just have to interview more people. Like, that's just what you have to do. And if you really need them in like a month or two, you'll just won't interview that many people because you'll just like, okay, I, I kind of need this person because that's going to make. Mm -hmm. And the thing is like a lot of the times, if you do need that person that month and it can make or break the business, you should hire them. But we just don't want to be in that position. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we spend a ton of our time uh, meeting a lot of people and recruiting and all of that. Do you come up with a, do you, did you guys come up with a plan like, Oh, this year or the next six months or three months, these or six months, these are the types of roles we would potentially look to fill. And so that's how you go or how, how is the, how is the process? Like, how do you decide who to meet and sort of uh, spend your time doing that? Um, so the way we do it is very particular to our situation because we've always been well capitalized, right? So that changes a little bit the way you look at this. I think if in Pagarme, we definitely didn't do like this because we're extremely cash constrained. Yeah. Um, but because here we were always well capitalized, one, engineers, if you find a good engineer, just hire them. Yeah. Like we never had like, oh, this is how many engineers we're going to hire. Like, it's such a, no, no. You just hire the, the, the really good ones that you mm -hmm. meet and then um, you just don't hire faster or slower than that. Yeah. Um, and if you think you're hiring too many people, just increase the bar, which is mm -hmm. great. Right. Um, on non-engineers, we've always been very very person-based instead of role-based. So a lot of the times we were like, okay, I think this person is really good. It may not be exactly the time that I would hire them, but I don't want to lose the opportunity of hiring someone like this good. Um, and good for us has like a set of uh, yeah. like a, a specific meaning. Um, so we, we were pretty opportunistic about hiring. And, some t and all the times that we hired someone and they thought it was too early, actually wasn't. Mm -hmm. Um, so we've been very happy about bringing sometimes people, uh, earlier than we thought it was. Yeah. Um, and I get that that's not an advice that goes for everybody because I think before product market fit, that's a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. But I think because our product was a credit card, like everyone needs a credit card. We just have to be like a better credit card. Mm -hmm. We, we never had a lot of question about product market fit. So we were able to do these things. Um, 
and it's it's been great till now like and the other thing is a lot of times managing is like a tough job yeah um and especially if you hire like more junior people you have to manage them a bunch i think that because we hired i think executives earlier than normal yeah yeah we could offload that a little bit because they were already really good managers mm -hmm. so we had that advantage too so i don't know if this is a general advice or not but like i'm sure yeah, yeah yeah no i think that it'll also help in context to put this in context because um fintech startups and also some you know we've seen a few other startups um in especially payroll or you know in those spaces um tend to, you know, getting to product market fit and getting to a launch takes longer, but then you have to fund yourself with capital uh, because that helps credibility with your partners and you need the partners to be able to launch a really good product. Um, so let's touch on that a little bit because I know we've talked about that, you know, at least two or three times. And I think it's unique to a certain set of startups. It's not applicable for everyone. Yeah. So can you talk about after you went through YC in winter 17, what was sort of your fundraising history, both Angel your series a and series b yeah um so we had um a, a series a kind of together for seed round in mm -hmm. march last year and that was uh i think seven and a half million dollar round um led by a fund called uh ribbit that was after yc right mm -hmm. uh and we I, I remember we closed that round the morning of demo day mm -hmm. um so it was very timely uh and that was uh, when uh, Peter and Max came in and like a lot of uh, other investors. Um, and then we we did in fundraise. I have a little bit of different opinion in fundraising than a lot of people. I think you should build relationship with VCs over time instead of just doing a fundraising process and then like stopping. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that if you're going to add someone to your life for like 10 years, 20 years, like you might as well know them outside of fundraising process. Yeah. Right. Um, so we did actively meet a bunch of people and like started having even a week after we finished fundraising, we kept taking the meetings and like say, Hey, we're not fundraising, but I would love to like getting to know the partners. Yeah, basically, I would love to get yeah. to know you. And like, and we met them three, like every three months or so. Um, and then when the, the, the B came around that, uh, we went with you guys, we already knew like everyone we wanted to talk to because mm -hmm. we already knew people we liked and that treated us super well and people that we didn't like that didn't treat us super well. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it was like a really fast process and, um, uh, because of that, right? Yeah. Um, and then and the I think one thing I would add there, this is where I think it's different for FinTech and maybe certain select startups. Um, because, you know, even though you guys are not launching publicly until now, I think the key difference is, you know, you were working on building the tech stack, the FinTech stack, and also you had at least more than 100 pilot customers, yeah. right? So it was already being used by quite a few startups. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's very similar to if you look at the Stripe or the Gusto story as well. Uh, you know, you can't, there's no room for errors in a payroll product. Yeah, you know, it exactly. has to, your paycheck has to come. And so, you know, Gusto sort of did the same thing, which is like almost for the first 15 months, they didn't publicly launch, but that doesn't mean they weren't testing the product exactly, uh, exactly. with customers, right? And so that's sort of what you guys were focusing during those 12, 15 months is what it takes uh, to launch at scale exactly. uh, by working with a few select startups. Exactly. And I'm not saying we're not going to have bugs, but we spend a lot of time trying to reduce yeah. the possibility of mm -hmm. having them because you're okay if like your restaurant app doesn't work, right? But yeah. you're not okay if like you're buying a dinner for a client and your yeah. car doesn't go through. Like how pissed would you be, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. And also like if the payments don't happen on time. Or, exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So I think that's a important distinction for anybody who is working in FinTech or a product where, you know, you don't have as much room for error. Um, and so, you know, it comes down really to founder market fit and then product market fit. And then seeing exactly. how to scale. And the other thing that's also true is for both Gusto, Stripe, and us, which is different from a lot of companies, is that everyone needs a version of you. Everyone needs a version of payroll. Everyone needs a version of payment processing. And everyone needs a version of um, corporate credit cards. You, you, you just have to be better than the other guys, which is a very different than like, I don't know if I need this um, product to optimize my lead or whatever, like, you mm -hmm. know? There's like, it, it's a little bit different concept when you're rebuilding something that already exists in a better way that everybody has to get one. And 
or you, when you're creating a new market or when you're like just building something better of something that already exists. Yeah. It's different set of challenges and different set of... Yeah. Um, and the stack is pretty complex. Yeah. Right? If exactly. you want to have to build it from scratch. Exactly. So, exactly. That's right. Exactly. So you've, this is your second fintech startup pretty much, right? So, yeah. and there are lots of, uh, f- you know, founders trying to build something new in the fintech space, especially these days. I mean, we can see that even in the volume of applications that YC is getting. What advice do you have for someone who is a new founder trying to build a fintech startup? So be super transparent on it is I don't think we could have built Brex if you were, have not built a fintech startup before. Mm-hmm. Um, or at least worked at an earlier stage fintech startup before. Because a big part of it is that when you get to a, like a meeting of a bank, like you know what you're talking about. Like you know how things work. You have credibility. You wouldn't be able to raise the size rounds we raised without like having that. Um, so I would either work in a, in a company, in an early stage fintech company that you think is successful, or I would like... Um, yeah, well, I started a fintech company that were, but in Brazil is like a way less competitive market, right? Like, so if maybe you're international, try to start something in, in your country and then after move to the US. I think in here in the US, it's really, really hard to do. And I, I really admire people that had done it um, from the first time um, and, and got it right. Like but Patrick I mean, and John. Yeah, right? like from Patrick Stripe. and John. Yeah. Um, but I don't think I, I personally could have done it without it. Mm-hmm. So I think like maybe joining would be a good idea. And for example, like people who joined Pagarme, like two of them started fintech companies that are doing really well in Brazil, right? Mm-hmm. Because they, they were able to get. Mm-hmm. And I'm pretty sure there's probably some Stripe alums that are starting fintech companies that are going to do phenomenally well. Mm-hmm. Um, what is difficult, you think, because of which having working at a early stage fintech startup or things that you learn from Pagarme? Like what, what, are, what are things that you think you will get core skills by working at a fintech early startup that you don't have? when you're starting new? I think that there is a few things. One, understanding how financial systems work. So if you're an engineer, understanding how to build financial systems is different than building like a regular mm-hmm. um, like app or database. There's a lot of extra constraints, etc. Second, there's just like knowledge about the market, how it works, and that you can learn, but it becomes really, f- like the innovation within payments is a deep understanding of the constraints and a deep understanding of how to like go around those constraints. Can you give an example? Um, so someone coming into the fintech market, for example, starting to build Brex, what people would say would be, hey, what do you do is you go and you hire this like company called a processor. And this processor, they take care of like all these things for you. And they're really good. And you go to talk to the processor and they're really good. They sell you that they do all these things like perfect. Like everyone does this. This seems to be a really good system. Just going to be an app, a mobile app on top of this. And it's going to be great, right? Um, And that's the common sense. If you tell someone, hey, I'm going to build my own processing stack from scratch, people will laugh at you. They're going to be like, no, man, you're crazy. If you ask anyone from any bank, they're going to, no, that's impossible. That's like super hard. Like Mm -hmm. you won't be able to do that. And the thing is, is that it is really hard, but it's doable. You know, and if you don't do it, you're going to be have a lot of constraints. And if you haven't done it before, if you haven't seen the system that worked from scratch before and how that worked and why it's complicated, it's actually is really hard to build one from scratch. Mm-hmm. Um, so in terms of, for example, engineering is, is something like that. Or the other example is um, so people tell you, oh, KYC, which is like the um, the way you have to get to your customer, right, for regulation purposes. This is the way you have to do it. You have to collect these documents, et cetera, et cetera. But if you actually go read the law itself, it gives you a lot of flexibility in the way you collect information, the way you validate information. Mm -hmm. And if you're not aware of like, how can you go read that law, understand how that works and apply it in that context and then how do you sell the bank that that is a good thing? Yeah. Like you won't be able to get away with it, right? It's not like you can create your inform and that's it. So I think just like, being able to navigate all those things is not like you have infinite amount of shots. Like you, you have like one or two shots that you have to get this thing right. So you have to have learned it from somewhere mm-hmm. um, before. Right? So it's a combination of knowing the regulatory requirements, understanding the complexity behind the financial systems and the tech stack, 
um, and knowing that just plastering something on the top is not going to work. Exactly. And giving and having the credibility for people to believe that you know that because you might know, yeah. but if nobody believes that you know because you've never done it, yeah. um, then it's going to be really hard. That's right? fair. That's fair. And for you guys in the US, for sure, um, it's definitely harder coming from Brazil, but the fact that you built Pagar at me helps you. Oh, 100%. Build that because credibility. we actually knew like our stuff. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what does Brex exactly do today, right? You're, you obviously are just going to launch. So what is the value proposition for a startup founder on why they should use Brex over other options? It yeah. sounds like getting a card is difficult, uh, but beyond getting a card, like what are the things Brex actually does? Yeah, for sure. Um, so the, we have basically have two things going um, very quickly. The first one is you can get a card like from sign up to working virtual credit cards, our credit card number to actually work and you can lose online in like four minutes. Four minutes? Yeah. Okay, so from so all the way from putting the entire information to getting a card, like literally same day, four minutes. Exactly, exactly. And um, so that was one. And today we're the only corporate card that doesn't require any kind of personal guarantee or security deposit or anything like that. Like we underwrite 100% of the company mm -hmm. um, and we give you a limit that's many times higher than most of the banks would give. Mm -hmm. uh, and like you can get in four minutes. Uh, so that's like one part of it. And the second part is that we automate a bunch of expense management stuff mm -hmm. that you would have to do um, manually. And we just do all of that for you. Um, and a bunch of expense management software can't do because they're not a credit card. They have to interact with the credit card. So we just build it all into the credit card and you don't have to worry about a lot of things later. Later. Yeah. Let me touch on the first point because I think that is a big uh, value proposition, especially to get the card pretty much in four minutes. Um, and is that something the founders get, the entire company gets? Like, how does how does that work? Well, the founder, founder that signed up gets yeah. the first one and they, they can invite anyone in their company. And that's like the yeah. time literally to fill in username, password, and delivery address. Yeah. And then they all instantly get a virtual credit card that works. And they can set limits to them. So not everybody has access to all the corporate credit mm -hmm. cards. You can give people a card of like $200 limits per person or whatever. Got it. And how are you able to underwrite, do the KYC checks that quickly? Like what is different about the Brex stack that helps you do that? So this is one of the things that we feel very strongly about is when you're rebuilding, like when you want to disrupt, like for example, I don't like disrupts, like a root. Mm -hmm. fancy word but redefining uh, the experience yeah when we redefine the experience like there's no way you can just build an app to on top of an existing thing or building like a dashboard on top of an existing financial product like we believe you have to actually rebuild the financial product mm -hmm. um so that's like one of the things that we we feel very strongly about and when we started Brex, we we're like okay we're not going to be like some sort of legion for an existing bank and they do everything we're going to do everything from scratch so um, in terms of underwriting, we went and we rebuilt the whole underwriting concept. And instead of looking at financial history, we look at cash, right? Like we look at how much investors actually invested in that company and wonder right based on that and the average burn rates and all of that, um, which is something that it's specific for startups at this point, mm -hmm. but it allows us to do it very quickly, mm -hmm. right? Um, so in terms of KYC, we just use modern methods to evaluate um, who you are and what you do, right? Like we use modern tools to not have to make you go to a branch and sign something physically. Like we have better technology to have you sign something digitally. Mm -hmm. So, and the reason banks don't do that is because they all rely on these third party, like old vendors that do everything for them and they don't implement this new technology. So we basically just like rebuild the entire system and the entire stack from scratch, which allowed us to do these things. Mm -hmm. And is that the reason why you waited for launching? Because it's not, you know, most YC startups launch after demo day, right? And you guys graduated in winter 17, but you're pretty much launching in mid 2018. Like what was sort of holding you up from launching it's exactly that like we would we didn't go to the strategy of like hey um let's um do something like uh and just launch it and have like whatever experience the bank gave us you know like we, we want to build something right mm -hmm. and we had to take the time to basically rebuild all these systems from scratch right like we had to build a general ledger inside the company that controls all the balances so we don't lose money, right? Mm -hmm. Those kind of things um, 
are really hard to build in the three months of YC. And we believe that why a lot of fintech startups fail is because they don't take control over um, the full experience and they, they're always limited by the bank partner doesn't want to do this or the bank partner doesn't want to do that or this this old system doesn't want to do this. We're like, we're not going to deal with any of this. We're just going to rebuild everything from scratch and, and launch with that. Yeah. And one other thing I know we've talked about in the past, but I think it'll be helpful for, you know, uh, our founder audience is like, there's lots of lessons and learnings you have from Pagar.me that you sort of brought in at Brex. Can you talk about especially uh, setting up the process right? Because I know that's something you felt very strongly about when you're launching Brex. And it's sort of how the product has been built to help the customer. Yeah. So the story on this is, we, when we started Pagarmet, we didn't know this thing called accounting existed. Mm -hmm. Like, we didn't know it was a thing. Well, you were 15 and 16. Yeah. <laughs> and we were like, oh, yeah, okay, give me your, um, your, your PL. I was like, what's a PL? Oh, it's just like how much your profit from the like, Okay, I just build a spreadsheet. Hey, this is how much cash we had and this is how much we burned, right? Yeah. You're like, no, I want a PL. And you're like, okay. And then Pedro and I, we literally went to study accounting and we literally, mm -hmm like did our books from scratch for three entire months because we had absolutely no accounting, right? And that was like, well, it was a great learning experience, but it took a lot of time and energy. And then when I, we got to Bragg's, we we're like, okay, we're not gonna have this problem. We're gonna have our accounting like really good from the first day. We're gonna have like our expense management systems and like all these things like really well set up from the first day. Because if you know what you're doing, it takes a day to set up everything, right? It was like yeah. not that big of a deal. And it pays so much dividends later on because like, one thing that's really important is being able to control your business, like know how much you're spending. And that doesn't mean cash burn. Like yeah. losses and spend and cash burn like are very different things. Um, know how much that you're actually making, right? Know on what you're spending is it, the categories, the vendors, like all of that. Um, and that's a pain in the ass to do, right? If you're going to do it manually with the existing systems, like I, I know it's really annoying and that's why like a lot of times founders just like don't do it and say, hey, when I raise my series A, or when I raise my series B, I'll just pay someone to do it. But like, it's not a type of thing also that you can throw money in a problem and then it's magically solved. Yeah. Right. Like you're going to have to spend your time on this and you just spend a day in the beginning setting these things up right. Mm -hmm. Like you won't have to deal with it in the future and it's like pay so much dividends. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's one of the lessons. We just like build the financial part of the company like right from day one. Day one. So yeah. let's talk about the second element of your product because the first element is the founder signs up. You're making it real easy for them to get access to card as well as a certain credit limit because they have some cash in the bank. They've raised from credible yeah. investors. So how, what exactly does Brex do to help set the process of accounting right for them? So basically a few things. Um, the first one is we think it's important for a company to know how much they spend on a vendor, mm -hmm. on a vendor base. How much when, you, when you say vendors like AWS, like Google. Uber, and AWS, Google, et cetera. Yeah. Today, the status quo is you know how much everything you pay through ACH or wire, you kind of know what you're spending on. But everything that you spend on card, you have no idea, right? You just credit card, $100,000, I have no idea what's in there. And then you have to get consolidate all these like extra reports from all these different services to know how much you're spending, right? Um, we actually give you a report and upload to your accounting system report on how much you're spending by vendor, mm -hmm. which is not possible in the current cars today. And the second thing is that like keeping track of receipts is something that if you don't enforce the policy from day one, people just won't do it in the future. And you're gonna have problems with that when you have to get an audit or like people are now have like all these expenses, et cetera. Um, so we just created a super easy way. They can just like text the receipt to us and that's it. We automatically match it to a transaction. And no, we don't have humans go in manually doing it. Um, it's actually automatic. And the reason we could automate this versus other companies couldn't is because we're both the credit card and we have the receipt. Mm -hmm. So matching a receipt to a transaction is a way easier job than reading the receipt and figuring out everything about it. Yeah. Um, so that's like the second thing that we do that it's super useful. And then we do all these things like we categorize everything right, like because the automatic categorization, not without getting too technical on payments, but like the automatic categorization from credit cards, they trust this thing called MCCs and that's always wrong. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, so like, for example, Uber, a lot of times comes as like car rental, right? And you don't want Uber as in your car rental. Like, yes. You want it as like taxi, right? Yeah. Um, so we redo that in the right way. There's like a bunch of things we do that you just don't have to worry about mm -hmm. it. Uh, and we use it for ourselves. And it's like, 
we literally have no trouble of accounting. We have our books every day. It's like, it's beautiful. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. That sounds great. And I know even though you are launching publicly only now, you have been piloting your product for a while. Can you talk a little bit about your customers? What types of customers use your product? Is this really early stage startups um, or later stage? And how do the different use cases work? So we have two use cases. Um, we're usually on the earlier stage when we're people's first card. Um, and they basically use, uh, sign up for us or switch to us because we're super easy to get. We deal with all these accounting things that they, um, they don't have, they don't want to deal with. Um, and they can just like don't not worry about it and like not have the hassle of doing it. And we have like, um, like a lot of the RYC batch uses it and the following. Um, YC batch, a bunch of people use it. So we got, we definitely use all the YC strategy, We're getting a lot of YC companies. Um, and we're very, very happy about that. And the other thing is like for companies that's over um, a certain size, we have another set of functionality that allows them to have better controls and like policies and stuff like that. So we got companies like uh, Firm or SoFi or Color Genomics to um, use Brex mm -hmm. because they, when they get bigger, they start having problems with their current corporate card. So we help them um, add better controls and better reporting and like a lot of larger company kind of functionality. Um, and that allows us to scale with the company. So yeah, we're pretty sure if like if someone starts with Brex, they can scale all the way with us Yeah, versus having to migrate to a different solution. Like yeah. Like yeah, it. one of the things I know, like when we were uh, working together on like talking to some of the growth stage companies, their uh, bigger pain points was like with controls and especially as the employee base expands, like how do you know what's the spend on expenses versus accounts payables and so on. Exactly. Yeah. And so, um, you know, that was something that's still a pain point that's not solved. So, exactly. So why do you think, I mean, why do you think this is getting solved now? Why didn't it get solved? Was this not a problem 10 years ago? I think that B2B, paying B2B with cards has grown a lot over the last five years. Mm -hmm. So if you think about like the largest company in the world, their main way to receive money is card, right? Like Microsoft, Google, Facebook, you pay all your Facebook ads with card until you're, you're really, really big. And you could still pay with card, but it's a discussion for another point. Um, and so I think that before like card was just for t and &E. card was something that you pay you gave your employees for travel mm -hmm. for um paying cabs here and there but now card is becoming this like procurement way of paying so like way to pay like your actual big expenses like a lot of offices are starting to take card like we work right like you yeah. can literally pay your card so now it's getting to um uh, it was always big, but now it's growing really, really fast and demanding new technology in the space to be able to scale to the company so it doesn't happen. Then, oh, now I agree, and I have to move everything off of card and into invoices, right? Um, so I think that changed like over the last five years. Yeah, and I also think with the new tech stack and the flexibility, like it's kind of absurd that you have a control or a set limit for the entire year versus is there something you can do more flexible at an employee level? Yeah. Right. Uh, for the company to better manage expenses and especially startups where the cash burn really fluctuates. Exactly. Month to month. So. Exactly. Um, that's great. And um, one, uh, you know, last question is basically you um, for fintech startups, especially like yourself, which has been, you know, around for 15 months. um it has been important for you to also fundraise from the right partners because that helps you build credibility for partnerships with banks or, you know, and, and even in the fintech ecosystem as you evolve. What were some of the lessons you learned from Pagar.me that you think has helped really set that foot grounding in uh, for Brex? Because you have, you know, Mac, you have some of the, uh, you have the PayPal founders, uh, you know, supporting you as well in this with Max and Peter. So what were some of the lessons you learned from Pagar.me that you brought here? I think that one of the biggest lessons is like in order to you to own the product, like you need to gain trust from your partner. Mm -hmm. And I think that like, especially in the US for a bank or a large company to work with a startup, it's really risky, right? Like they don't know if you're going to be around mm -hmm. um, for a long time. So they're putting all these resources into you. And then if you don't work, they just like waste your time and that person may lose your job, their job. 
So I think it's really important to have someone really high up in the organization, which you're partnering with, and to trust you. Mm -hmm. And in, in order to be able to own the whole thing, you need to have someone like really high up in the organization to trust you, right? And for us, um, we deeply value having um, investors that would help us get that credibility. Mm -hmm. um, so on our fundraising process, we were like, okay, how do we get the best people that we can to increase credibility of these partners, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that paid huge dividends. Like um, being able to, like one of our investors introduced us to like the partner that we're working with, uh, and that went huge ways coming from him and and all those things and like the backing. And I think that, and this is a little bit controversial also, but in a fintech company, the amount of money you raise matters a lot also mm -hmm. because like if you raise like a million dollars being a fintech company, like the partner, they just won't trust you, mm -hmm. right? Like they they probably spend a million dollars on t &E per month. Yeah. Um, so they, having investors that also can back you up like a little bit more um, strongly financially, like matters a lot too. No, that makes sense because, you know, um, you know, we have a whole portfolio of fintech startups and it's true that uh, raising sufficient capital as a signal to the partner that it's credible is important early on. And it's interesting because with Pagar.me, you had raised only $300,000 in total, right? Versus here, uh, you were pretty much from day one focused on how to build the right partners for you. Yeah, for sure. Pagar.me had this specific thing is that our investor that invested $300,000 was the company that we needed most of the strategic partnership with. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a little bit of a different scenario in which it was kind of like a strategic investor for that way. And that's how we solved there because we were 15, 16. We didn't have enough credibility to get all these like great investors, right? Yeah. Um, so we, we had to do that. Um, but here, uh, the better solution for us is let, let's be independent. Mm -hmm. Let's not have be tied up to one partner. Mm -hmm. um, and but by that, by that, we needed to have a strong balance sheet and we needed to have strong investors and strong team and all that. Mm -hmm. And basically rebuild the fintech and the tech stack from scratch. to be from scratch to be able to do this. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, Henrique, for joining us today. Um, I'm sure that a lot of people probably really enjoyed the discussion, especially from how to start a fintech startup. <laughs> thank you very much.